Christmas Eve, Cavalier, Northeast, North Dakota. Blizzard Alvin is starting to rage. Don, a senior citizen, is safe and sound and cozy in his motel, grandly called the Cavalier Inn. While eight miles away, his wife is cozy in her parents' home in Hamilton, North Dakota, population 61. Don feels claustrophobic there. He needs his space, thus the grandly named Cavalier Motel. In the middle of this stormy night, the Grand Forks PBS station runs a documentary on contemporary conquests of Everest. Some guy who's had a knee replacement struggling toward the summit with his own personal buddy guide to help wrench the faux knee back into place whenever it pops out. Our hero's investment paying for the guide and for himself must have run close to 200K. Don roots for him to fall into a crevasse. <laughs> Don's own passion for mountaineering had been ignited at summer camp. His counselor reading a good night story, an alpine adventure novel. Don never knew what the plot was beyond climbing the Jungfrau, or maybe it was a Matterhorn, because he always fell asleep after a page or two. But crampons and ice axes, pitons and carabiners, roped up, slogging skyward, danced in his dreams. By the standards of the old days, Everest had become an obscenity, a pig pen, an exquisite symbol of money despoiling the sacred. By morning, the snow had drifted four feet deep outside Don's room. Don had read an announcement on the motel's bulletin board that St. Gabriel's Catholic Church was hosting a community Christmas dinner. So at 11.30, he gears up and trudges over. The wind is still driving a white mist, and his sunglasses fog up, and his nose freezes, even with his red knit face mask pulled up all the way. He finds his way to the community room behind the church. At the far end, near the kitchen, some 30 seniors, like himself, are already sitting down. He introduces himself to the priest, who urges him to join the last stragglers at the buffet. The people whose table he sits down at know his in-laws, of course. The pies, unfortunately, understandably, are store-bought. That afternoon and evening and night, it continues to snow, and he reads in his motel room. By the morning after Christmas, the snow plows have cleared the downtown streets. Eventually, this stuff will be hauled away, but for the moment, it's been pushed up on the sidewalk along 2nd Street. The plows have pushed like tectonic plates until the warehouse snow rises to a crenellated ridge. The result is a man-made wonder. The west face of this mountain is a sheer block-long wall, a mountain range, not an individual peak. The east face has disappeared because the gap beyond, in more clement times, a scraggly strip of lawn has filled in with drift. Don surveys this savage landscape on the way to breakfast at Thompson's Cafe. He thinks it might be fun to attempt an ascent. He also thinks it might be a bit silly, a grown man, and an old one at that, mountain climbing in downtown Cavalier, North Dakota. After two eggs over easy, hash browns, steak, biscuits and hot chocolate, he heads for base camp. There is no one else walking around downtown. It isn't particularly cold, about five degrees, but it's cold enough. The Cavalier Sierra 
gleams in the pewter sun. Clean, purposeful, sheer. Shortly after they were married, they'd driven around the state, visiting Marianne's old friends. They'd gotten as far west as Mandan, where Lewis and Clark had wintered in 1804, where Custer had set up housekeeping on a bluff with a commanding view. On the way home, Marianne asked how he'd liked all the different parts of North Dakota. I enjoyed the trip, Don replied, but there seemed to be only two parts, the flat and the very flat. <laughs> he kicks his left Atasca Ziggy after ski boot with backside Velcro into the steep slope and pushes up. His footing holds. He advances another step and another. He punches his fingers into the snow, not so much to get a grip, but to remain engaged with the surface. Now that he is actually attacking the first, and in matter of fact, the only pitch, he begins to worry. What if he crashes back to the sidewalk? Such anxiety, he realizes, even if unwarranted, is useful. It helps maintain focus. What a glorious way to put up a route. Directissima. The next step holds, and the next, and the summit is within reach. But of course, there isn't any summit. There is just the edge that has been left by the snow plows sharp blade. Don takes two more small steps and looks back down to assess what he has accomplished. It really wouldn't be fun to fall from such a height. He reaches up and tears off a patch of the crenellation. He sweeps the back of his hand to level off some more. He steps up a last step. Perhaps he could compress a platform that would allow him to stand on top and gain a comprehensive panorama of downtown Cavalier, North Dakota. He slides his right knee up as if to straddle the top and plunges over to the other side into the drift. It is the obverse of the fall he had feared. It is a headfirst plummet, a jackknife dive, his arms extended to ease passage into the new medium. He sinks all the way in. He is completely submerged in the downy, billowy snow. The irony washes over him as the drift embraces him. He thrashes his feet and drives himself deeper. His head wedges tight. The snow begins to numb his face. He doesn't think anyone will hear him, but he screams, Ahoy!